All right, welcome back to AI4 2021 Finance Summit presented by Dot Data. I hope you're having an awesome time so far. I'm excited to introduce our next panel, the state of AI in banking. Please join me in welcoming our panelists to the virtual stage. Thanks so much for the introduction, Patrika. Uh, we're very excited to be here and think it's pretty fair to say that artificial intelligence and machine learning have moved from the realm of academic research to the power of commercialization. And often when we think about AI, we think about large consumer internet companies, the likes of Google and Facebook, who have very extensive machine learning science research labs. But today we're going to talk about applications in another industry, namely that of financial services and banking. So I'd love to start off with an introduction from uh, the fellow panelist speakers today. Alex, why don't you start us off? Hey, Catherine, thanks so much for the great introduction and, and, uh, and everyone for uh, the being here for the conversation today. So I'm Alex, I'm uh, uh, one of the co-founders and CEO of Snorkel AI. We're a, a company that is uh, building a platform called Snorkel Flow, uh, serving customers in the financial space along with uh, others. And I'm also on the faculty of computer science at the University of Washington. Uh, super excited to talk about this uh, today. Ashit, why don't you go next? Thanks, Catherine. I'm happy to be here with my co-panelists. Uh, so I'm Ashit Talibdar. I lead the AI machine learning initiatives at Mooney's Analytics. Uh, brief introduction to myself. I worked in R&D and AI for over 20 years. I have a PhD from CME in the 90s when literally AI was still in research labs. Um, so, and I started my career at JPL NASA. So I'm the only rocket scientist here at Mooney's Analytics. Uh, probably in the panel here too. So uh, uh, I, you know, I, I did my research at JPL NASA for over 12 years. And then as AI kind of evolved into more uh, enterprise type domains. I went to NIST where I started the data science program. Um, and then I've been at Moody's for about four years now. Um, I lead the AI Center of Excellence here. So over time, we have actually built up a large team of AI experts and we kind of lead both the strategy functions and then the product initiatives here. So I look forward to the discussions. Wonderful. Uh, Prashant. Hi, thanks, Catherine. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for providing the opportunity. Uh, my name is Prashant Dhingra. I lead machine learning practice at, at JP Morgan Chase. I'm a managing director for machine learning. Prior to JP Morgan Chase, I worked at Google and at Microsoft. So I was heading machine learning for IoT domain at Google. And I, was al I also worked at Bing SQL Server and Azure machine learning product at uh, Microsoft. Uh, I think I moved to AI at right time. I used to be a software engineer. And then uh, in 2008, I was head of BICOE at Microsoft. And the stock market went down in BIC, uh, and the budget was crunching. So that time, I took a position in machine learning. I moved to Bing from BI. And since uh, 2008, I've been working in machine learning, and it has been a very interesting journey. I think AI will continue to grow. And I have found it very rewarding. And I, I believe people who will be participating and uh, using more and more AI, it will make them wise. Uh, in a daily life and uh, whether they are in the AI role or not. So I'm very ha I'm happy to be here and um, I'm looking forward to share our experience. Thank you, Prashant. Uh, I'm Catherine. I currently head up a group called Borealis AI, which is the machine learning research lab for the Royal Bank of Canada. Uh, I've been working in the machine learning space for the past six years. Um, I started my career in this field at a startup called Fast Forward Labs which was subsequently acquired by Cloud, Cloudera. And in that, in that capacity, had worked with over 50 Fortune 500 companies advising them on their enterprise machine learning strategy. Um, I bring a slightly unorthodox background. I started off my career in the private industry working for a legal software company and gained expertise in risk management and professional ethics in law firms. I had a stint as a professor, an associate professor of law I'm um, at the University of Calgary teaching how ethical paradigms were being impacted by new technologies. And so bring that um, ethics and governance lens to my work in machine learning, which is quite relevant in the, in the field of banking as we think about compliance with regulation and uh, all of the sort of beyond regulation ethical um, considerations we, we have to take into account as uh, product developers and machine learning practitioners. So I think it's it's fair to say as we as we listen to these introductions that we have a, a, a nice diverse set of viewpoints on the panel. I think there's uh, both uh, Prashant and I come from, you know, we're working for financial services institutions themselves. So we have that sort of inside 
inside view on, um, on, on where banks stand. I think with the perspective from Moody's, we have the, the, the layer of credit analysis and the larger industry. And then obviously with Snorkel, there's the not quite FinTech, but I think, you know, sort of a machine learning um, startup uh, perspective on, yeah. you know, the outside and serving, serving the bank. So I think, I think the, there's, there's a broad set of perspectives that should lead to a rich decision. I can be more blunt. I mean, we, we, uh, <laughs> we, we sell software to banks. So uh, yeah. that, there's, there's my bias, although a lot of our theory that we worked on back at Stanford where, where the project started uh, uh, is specifically about how you can get very useful signal out of even, you know, biased or, or noisy signals. So uh, um, yeah, there, there's my, my uh, perspective on the table, but also, uh, you know, through Stanford and, and University of Washington, you know, talk just from the kind of broader ML systems and ML research perspective with, you know, hundreds of Fortune 50 companies, including, you know, many or, uh, you know, many of the major banks. And uh, so I'm excited to kind of chat, chat both of my snorkel hat on about, you know, uh, without detail, some of the value that, that, that we're helping to support, you know, in real deployments, but also uh, just about some of the challenges and, and honestly, some of the unsolved uh, problems that I've heard echoed in just conversations in, you know, the, the, the broader space. So, uh, yeah, but anyway, Catherine, super excited to proceed with the discussion. All right, wonderful. Um, why don't we start up with the first question? So I think it, pretty broad, uh, probably some folks in the audience who are listening who are asking themselves, banks and AI, AI and banks, like what's, how, 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 how tight is this marriage or is this a breakup waiting to happen? Um, Prashant, why don't you start us off? So organizing data and understanding data is a key competency any enterprise needs to have, whether it is a bank or health or any other industry. And AI helps us in organizing data. So even if uh, the data, uh, big data technology has come and we are able to capture more data, we are able to understand more data, the world is changing even faster. The rate of acceleration has also increased. So it has become more and more important to understand the data and uh, to understand data, AI can be utilized in multiple ways. Like uh, many times uh, we only talk about prediction, but uh, machine learning is uh, uh, useful to understand um, the data, reason the data, and even uh, design what kind of a product should be built, et cetera. So every company uh, needs to become a tech company and a data company. And the reason finance companies are even better placed, uh, in my view, finance companies can generate ROI from machine learning quicker compared to manufacturing or health domain. Because if you are building an aeroplane or if you are building a, uh, you have a large manufacturing plant, it takes like three year, five year and in a in aircraft industry, even more to get an ROI. But in a finance, if you build an AI, you are likely to get results from few months to in a year's time. Um, and finance companies uh, ha has a good uh, have good motivation because finance, uh, uh, like finance is important for the society uh, and uh, uh, it is data driven. Uh, and and uh, so finance is, is very well placed to utilize the data, make the quants or make the, um, uh, uh, make the whole enterprise smarter and wiser. Um, so I think banks will be utilizing AI and machine learning techniques across all the departments. Yeah, so I'd like to add to that. Uh, so, so, you know, addressing the question that you put up there, uh, I think the correct answer is somewhere in between. It's AI and banks are not a perfect match, but neither is it headed for a breakup. <laughs> uh, I'd say it's a match with imperfections that need some long-term planning, strategic approaches, and some TLC to succeed, right? Uh, putting it in the context for, of, of a marriage. <laughs> Um, I actually see for, you know, if, if you look forward a few years, uh, I see AI and technology transforming banks. Uh, and it's actually going to be accelerated by COVID in the past year. Uh, and we're going to see that hand in hand with changes in regulations, which actually limit the adoption of AI right now. And I'm sure we'll talk about it a little bit more. Um, and, and also the emergence of fintechs, I think, is going to drive the legacy banks to kind of forced to change uh, faster than they normally would. So there'll be some bumps along the road um, in terms of AI adoption in, in the banking sector uh, and in finance, uh, especially for the legacy banks. Uh, but I think many will catch up. Now, I'd like to point out though that the problems that AI will face in finance is not unique only to finance. Uh, if you look at healthcare, for example, it faces a similar challenge. 
Uh, look at IBM uh, Watson, uh, uh, the healthcare unit. Uh, IBM actually spent billions of dollars in the last five years uh, doing acquisition and tech development just for healthcare uh, and AI and healthcare. But essentially what happened was it was not being profitable anymore. So the recent news is that they're going to, they're planning to sell the unit uh, off uh, to uh, and look at more profitable initiatives. And some of the challenges that, that they faced, uh, including Google Health, is in the regulatory domain, which is data privacy and data regulations face, impose a lot of hurdles. And that's very similar to what the finance sector faces. Um, so I think it's not unique, uh, but we are going to overcome it, uh, overcome it in the next few years, I would say. I think that yeah, I, and I can certainly uh, emphasize that. I'll take it, Alex, and pass it over to you. Um, whereby it's almost like there's been st the use of statistical models in banking for quite a long time. Um, so, you know, credit, credit adjudication, various processes to try to assess the risk of offering a financial product to uh, either, a, either a citizen consumer or, to, or, or a business have, have used data in some sort of modeling technique. Um, so there's one, there's one aspect, which is, it goes to the sort of perennial question, what qualifies as advanced analytics and what qualifies as machine learning. But I think there is an opportunity to move from handcrafted features to you know, learning representations and, and potentially adding, adding a new type of modeling techniques to improve the performance of, of those traditional models. Um, there's certain types of, of AI where you know, it's, it's, there's a question of how much value it'll add to financial services. And here I'm thinking about image, image processing and, and computer, vision, uh, um, uh, computer vision applications. I've seen some use of you know, processing satellite data to try to either evaluate a home price or um, in alternative data used in, in, the, in the stock and trading markets to you know, count cars in Walmart parking lots as a proxy indicator for potential success. That's been going on for the last five or six years. But um, when it comes to things like an analysis of video data, you know, should we be building that internally at the banks ourselves? My team could work on that, but we'll likely outsource that to the likes of NVIDIA you know, or, or Zoom um, and, and have them, their machine learning teams take care of that. So, so there's, it, it's, there, there's tons of opportunities, but there's also some potential problem spaces where it's, it's best left to external teams as opposed to teams inside the banks. Uh, Alex, you're gonna say. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't think I'm gonna, I think those are all great points. I'm not gonna say anything too controversial uh, to add on to that. I think some of our current customers would be angry if I, <laughs> after having, you know, shared excitement about results, you know, in banking uh, on our platform, then said, I, I think it's a, a terrible uh, partnership and marriage uh, between AI and banking. But, um, you know, not to be too pedantic, I think, you know, at the broadest level, you know, AI in the traditional sense just refers to automation of, I mean, it's a very broad and, and classical umbrella term, right? So it just, you know, means automation of processes. And I think there, you know, given the amount of processes that go into, you know, such a complex and important system like banking, and I'll, and I'll focus, I guess, on, on banking, given the prompt rather than finance in, in general, because I think, you know, ML, AI are used in very different ways if you're thinking about, you know, a, a quant trading firm versus, you know, a, a, a bank proper, I know the lines blur, but, you know, but, um, uh, so, so I think, you know, AI in general, can, can we achieve some automation? Of course, you know, uh, automation that both assists analysts as well as, you know, replaces some functions or rather, whether it's decision-making or, or structuring of data, like you, like you said, Prashant, and like a lot of you know, our work is in. Um, I think broadly there, the answer is just kind of almost trivial is to say, uh, yes, of course. I mean, it's such a complex system with uh, such, you know, uh, uh, flows of data and, and importance, you know, the, you know, the answer kind of trivially is yes. Then you kind of get, you know, the next concentric circle of machine learning, where you know it used to be called statistics, and now it's uh, now it's machine learning, or you know, it used to be a logistic regressor, and now it's a single layer deep neural network. If you're a, you know, uh, if you like that joke, um, not really a joke, I guess that's how things are phrased these days. But um, you know, there, you know, machine learning has been used, and that there have been you know statistical models, you know, being used in, in banking and finance for for decades, right, or centuries, depending how you define it. So um, there, I think it's undeniable there's value. And then you get to the question of, you know, kind of, you know, what a lot of people refer to and are excited by and, and, and you know, a lot of us are working with, which is kind of modern, you know, ML methods uh, that are getting people excited. Often you're talking about, you know, deep or representation learning methods like you referred to, Catherine, where, where you know, you're not only learning a machine learning model, but you're kind of learning all the features and, and a lot of the kind of architecture of the model just from scratch with data, you can handle all these more complex unstructured data types like text, PDF, you know, websites, image, video, time series, beyond. And there, you know, I, I, I think 
uh, obviously we work in that space. We, we've seen some of the places where it, it provides value working with, you know, obviously customers in many verticals, you know, government, medical, insurance, retail, but but also, you know, with, with some you know, major U.S. Uh, banks currently as customers. But, um, you know, I, I think I think it has uh, there's a great opportunity there. But there are, you know, obviously sufficient, you know, significant deficiencies with how it's being kind of the standard way of using these modern techniques today, you know, when you come to, you know, banking or really any other industry where you have, you know, considerations around things like privacy, auditability, um, uh, you know, uh, just consequences, you know, you're not predicting cat first dog, you're, you're, you know, making very, you know, momentous or important decisions and you need to uh, be able to, you know, audit and interpret and react. And also where you have a lot of data privacy, you have a lot of expertise that needs to go into preparation and, 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 um, I'm assuming we'll talk about some of those interesting challenges and, and opportunities, you know, as the panel goes on. But I can give you know the quick perspective just of where I'm coming from. You know, most of uh, our research uh, originally at the Stanford AI Lab for many years uh, um, with an open source project called Snorkel, and now in a company called Snorkel. We're very creative namers, um, where we're building a platform called Snorkel Flow that's uh, serving you know uh, many Fortune 50 customers, including in banking, also in the government side. So many um, of these areas where you have, you know very private data, lots of expertise needed, very important decisions uh, uh, around this data. Um, to give a sense of applications, you know, often our platform is used to in, in the banking world to do things like help uh, make decisions or extract information from complex documents, PDFs, um, uh, news data, you know, news feeds, um, uh, network data even. Um, uh, you know, it's a pretty general platform, but the kind of core motivation for us over the years has been about the uh, what's called training data that's needed to teach these machine learning models. So, you know, I'll throw that out there and maybe we can, we'll circle back to when we talk about some of the challenges. This is one that we have focused on and anchored around for years now, which is, you know, all these methods seem almost too good to be true. And you can look at the results that, you know, we and many others in the space have published and, and they honestly sometimes are, but there's always a catch, no free lunch. And the catch is that they are extraordinarily data hungry and not just, you know, any kind of data from the, you know, uh, data is the new oil era where it's just collect all the data, uh, uh, you know, from, uh, you know, all the, all the websites, all the things, but data that's been carefully, you know, labeled, curated according to specific business objectives, specific, you know, uh, uh, pipelines. And this is what we call training data. So, you know, you want to teach a, uh, um, a machine learning approach and modern AI approach to, you know, classify legal contracts in a bank. You need to have some legal associates label thousands or hundreds of thousands of you know, those documents first, uh, according to the spec. And so um, this is really difficult when you know, you're not labeling cats and dogs, which you can do cheaply or stop signs, but you're labeling you know, highly complex private you know, and uh, you know, uh, data types that, and, and the way you're labeling them shifts constantly in regard to you know, uh, objectives. And um, so I think there are many challenges, but, but how you manage that data that fuels all of this AI progress is, is one that we focused on that I think is both you know, highlights the opportunity. We're working on on you know programmatic ways of handling this that have been very you know had, had some you know nice successes, but also just the challenges that you know this is the foundation that modern AI rests on is tons and tons of nicely you know, curated data. And you know you, you think oh banks have lots of data, but you know is it nicely labeled or is it easy to get it labeled or set up in the right way for modern AI? The answer is mostly you know no. And so um, anyway, I went way too long, but but I, I think I'm dipping into the not just the excitement part, but the challenges part. But I think the answer is, I think there's there's significant challenges with just taking all the exciting AI progress and especially deep learning progress we see and just plopping it into the banking world, really just like there is with government, with insurance, with medical, with any kind of you know serious setting, um, but but also tons of opportunity. Anyway, I, I wax too poetic, so I'm gonna cut myself off. I think Alex uh, already transitioned us to the next question, which is, you know, the various challenges that banks face. Um, so we've touched a little bit upon regulation, but I think we can go deeper in that. Um, and then Alex, you know, I uh, talked a lot about the fact that I, I think it's right there. We, we went through the sort of data is the new oil era. And I think um, a lot of the financial services institutions, and this goes across industries, they've, they've absorbed that you know, that they, they need to have a lot of data, but they haven't always thought about it with an eye towards labeled training data sets to support supervised learning applications. So that's that's definitely one area. Um, Prashant, how about some others? So regarding the uh, uh, challenges, 
like not only bank has this challenge but uh, other other enterprise also ha have this challenge that uh, uh, and bank bank uh, are impacted more so if you think about uh, machine learning machine learning gives you abstract information from data and if you look into even complex neural network each layer abstract the data pass it to higher level layer uh, up to a point where uh, your task is done so it's all about abstraction now uh, uh, historically banks have used statistics so they they follow equations and if something can't be written in the form of equation uh, it requires a significant change that uh, now the life is based on approximation and abstraction not on equation and uh, it impacts all industry but i think it impacts uh, banks more uh, having having said that uh, um, i think uh, i have seen a significant progress in bank once we explain the concept uh, banks are more and more willing to uh, follow this path and uh, many times we hear this concern about regulation and uh, i i personally think that regulation also impact google and facebook and probably they are scrutinized more so if they have overcome that challenge uh, banks can also overcome that challenge with the right education and with the uh, right leadership in place the one area where i see uh, which i see a big challenge in innovation in ml um, is most of the time we hire uh, phd or graduates who bring lot of uh, expertise and skill uh, but um, we require also experienced ml leaders who should know what is a good experiment versus, versus what is a bad failure because companies keep doing an experiment and then they say it failed so on one side we need to encourage good experimentation but on the other side we can't just keep on failing and saying that these were these were experiment uh, so there needs to be a clear philosophy what is a good experimentation versus what is a bad failure and once we have that philosophy and if we then move the needle toward good experimentation it turbo boost the innovation uh, so i think that is a key area uh, uh, we want to focus on and by focusing on good experiment uh, one can innovate faster and this goes back further to the data uh, like earlier we talked about data challenge so that, that one require label label data but uh, ultimately the goal is how well we can monetize our data what in information we can get from it how we can make uh, our quant and uh, uh, like workforce more wiser so that they can make better decision um, so with the right experimentation we can get the meaning from a data we can also explore what kind of a new product or what kind of a new philosophies needs to be uh, brought in and that's why banks can even beat fintech because they have large amount of data and with the right amount of exploration they, they have a competitive advantage so in my view the biggest challenge is how we enable the good experimentation yeah i i just want to uh, oh sorry i should go on yeah i i tend to agree with that and you know that's where i think the legacy institutions have some challenges because they have a lot of data but many of it is siloed it's fragmented in legacy systems and that poses uh, for the legacy the incumbent banks uh, a challenge for them to leverage the data and build ai models that then add analytics and value into the data so that's one i guess area where banks uh, face a challenge uh, and uh, you know the incumbents don't have the legacy systems to deal with i'm sorry the, the newcomers the fintechs don't have the uh, sort of the legacy system to deal with so they can actually build the it the technology super highway from scratch that makes it easier talking about regulation i know we touched upon that prashant talked a little bit about it um we see some recent emphasis uh, and research progress on explainable ai models so ai is typically black box as we refer to compared to the credit decisioning models uh, in the past which have been statistical based uh, but i think with some recent progress in explainable ai models we are going to see some uh, better adoption of ai uh, across the board in credit decisioning uh, kyc and so on um and uh the other thing that banks i think the the incumbent banks uh face the challenges they face is that on one hand they must manage the scale the security standards of a large enterprise right uh because they have these legacy systems to deal with um and on the other hand they have to achieve the speed and the agility flexibility of fintechs which can move much much faster and i think i've seen a lot of um uh motion around that where uh now the legacy banks have set up innovation units i mean we are part of a innovation unit uh 
from which the AI Center of Excellence operates. And that allows us to literally go the speed of a startup uh, while leveraging the, the legacy data that Moody's has, that the financial institutions have to build better decisioning uh, capability uh, using the legacy data, the, the tens of, you know, uh, 50 years of data that we have. Uh, the other challenge that I think the, the legacy banks have is also talent. So th there's a lot of expertise in statistical uh, techniques uh, using, you know, uh, traditional languages like R. Uh, but now uh, with the prevalence of AI and ML, uh, you almost have to upskill the existing talent base uh, to avoid rocking the boat too much. Uh, and that's a real challenge that banks uh, face, but you know, they're going through upskilling of, uh, of the existing talent. Um, and then you know, uh, my AI unit, we make sure that we uh, basically hire people with deep AI expertise. And then we follow the hub and spoke model where we provide the AI expertise and then the business units actually provide the business needs, uh, the business drivers. And that's a very nice way uh, to actually build up these uh, AI initiatives uh, quickly over time. It's interesting because we have um, the same model, so the hub and spoke, where you know the team that I lead is the machine learning expertise, and then we partner up with the different business lines to deliver applications. But I do think one of the challenges is uh, finding requisite domain knowledge to both inform the structure of the model, going back to Alex's point, um, and really understand the business problem. Um, this is a, we talked a little bit about banking versus finance, but I think this becomes particularly acute in collaboration with our uh, capital markets uh, colleagues because the the space. If, if we think in bank, you know, in the in the consumer retail banking world, we'll build out personalization applications into the mobile application um, and. It takes some time to understand the space, but there's there's sort of an intuition that the teams have, even if they're not you know deep domain experts in financial services. But once we get into derivatives pricing, where um, you know as, as we've discussed, there's today the the, the, the legacy functions are quite complex and take a, a, quite a long time to to compute and execute. And so there's an opportunity to use functional approximations using you know the modern toolkits to trade a slight bit of accuracy in, in, in favor of computing the price or risk of, of a financial product in seconds as opposed to days. So, so uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of benefit and you know, the, my team will bring, bring in the skill set, but it takes us a couple of months <laughs> to, you know, to read the textbooks on derivatives and, and really understand the space as well as the legacy um, infrastructure environment. And you know, the, I think the, the, the second part where it can be tricky is just getting a, a machine learning system into production um, and building the right in integrations, you know, there's there's always decisions of the short term versus the long term. Which platform are we going to upgrade across the enterprise? Where are we happy with some hacky solution that we're, we'll throw away the code in a couple of years? Um, so I think these are standard. This is outside of the domain of AI. It's sort of any innovation in a legacy environment, but we certainly see that. The other one that I wanted to touch upon, going back to Prashant's point on experimentation, is, and again, this is across I think traditional industries. Um, the comfort with uncertainty, uh, both in the early phase of the product development process, where we're not sure if the model is going to converge. You know, we're not sure if we have the data. So there's, I think about it as fitting the, the square peg of experimentation into the round hole of KPIs and business results, where there'll be a little friction and um, you know, having the business partners that we collaborate with be comfortable with the fact that this might just not work. Um, it's not like we're not managing risk like agile, where we're you know, cutting down our sprints to two weeks with the knowledge that the, we want to get feedback on features before we commit to a long-term dev. It's like, it could take two weeks and it could take a year, you know, <laughs> we just don't know before we start. Um, and then the second cultural shift, I think, is comfort with the, a probabilistic output. Um, Prashant, you know, you talked about these layers of abstraction, but um, I think there's, there's reticence, depends on the problem space, but particular with a client facing application, reticence to predict cash flow incorrectly um, and lose customers trust, not only around data privacy, right? So lots of concerns around um, ensuring that, you know, the trust is there and, and customers don't have a sense that we're using their data in an untoward manner, but also there's, there's, a, there's a, a broader shift to be done to educate the general populace in um, processing probabilistic outputs. Um, you know, and understanding confidence ranges, et cetera. And I find that actually a fantastic design 
question for AI product development at scale, but um, it can slow things down because uh, you know uh, sometimes our, you know the, the 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 bank is not not quite comfortable with with uh, putting forth a, a feature that has fifty percent accuracy or something. Um, I want to move on in the interest of time. Um, our next question, Patrika. I think it's around concrete use cases. So let's do this one a little quickly um, as we move through. But how about for each of us um, sharing one particular opportunity or use case around AI? Okay, uh, first of all, in general, uh, the reason I changed job from Google to JP Morgan, uh, I saw that there is a regime shift happening that earlier product company used to build a product uh, using code like Microsoft and Google build product using consumer data. So there is a lot of opportunity to build enterprise solutions which Google or Amazon can't build. Like even if they are building various uh, AI solution but they can't build it for finance domain. So I think there is a lot of opportunity in finance and other domains where depending upon data solution needs to be built. So now going uh, specifically, so you will see like there are various problems which are considered unsolvable problem. For example, whether if you try to build something for explainability for the whole world or uh, auto ML for the whole world or even reinforcement learner for the whole world, these are unsolvable problem. But uh, the opportunities we have is like when we work in a bank, if we constrain a problem to a domain, we can convert these unsolvable problem into a solvable problem. So that's the personal motivation uh, I had. I saw that regime shift and, and I changed job and that's how like uh, we hired uh, other member. And uh, we, we see that uh, once we have that data related to bank, so whether it is a, a NLP data, which is a, it may be uh, earning calls or it may be uh, how trading happens, uh, one can build a lot of things which rest of the world or rest of the product companies can't build it for us. Um, so that is the opportunity I, I, I see it broadly. So I will not be able to share explicit detail about the use cases, but uh, I see a lot of success by constraining a problem to a domain, finance domain, and then solving it. Yeah, I can jump in and broadly say, I, I obviously can't share uh, you know, customer details, but at, at a you know, broad level, um, you know, there's a huge opportunity with modern techniques, even though I, I was, you know, talking about challenges with respect to them, which obviously is why our, you know, uh, what, 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 you know, what we've been doing, what we've been doing, um, uh, huge opportunities with respect to especially unstructured data. So, you know, think about things like, uh, you know, text is a canonical type of unstructured data, uh, something that we often call semi or richly structured data. So, you know, uh, HTML, um, PDFs, um, you know, uh, things attached to emails, um, uh, but of course, you know, extending into network image, video, et cetera, but especially I'd say around just, just, you know, large, complex, unstructured documents, PDFs, et cetera, being able to, um, you know, classify, route them, extract information from that, them, them essentially turn unstructured data into structured data, you know, take, imagine taking a 300 page document, turning it into an Excel spreadsheet with columns that are specified according to, you know, what the, 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 the business objectives are. And so that's, that's what, you know, where there's been, in some sense, this is the, the biggest delta of progress if you have enough training data. And um, on that front, I'll mention just, you know, briefly that, uh, you know, you know data is still oil for ML. It just needs to be refined. That's the kind of, you know, uh, uh, you know cheesy way to say it, but, but you know, very, uh, you know, directly true from our perspective, right? So banks still have an incredible amount of this data um, and the subject matter expertise. Um, uh, maybe we'll talk about that later, but but Catherine, to your point, you know the, the, the domain expertise is absolutely critical here. You essentially need to fuse the data with, you know, in say in supervised learning, like we work in, you know, how to label it, uh, but also more broadly, just that domain expertise. Banks have tons of that stuff, uh, both, uh, and, and so there's a tremendous opportunity to pair, you know, the data, the subject matter expertise with modern machine learning model architectures that have had have seen, you know, massive advances in the last, you know five, 10 years around specifically unstructured data to, to see some exciting advances there. So tons of places where good old fashioned ML, you know, should still be the way the, 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 the land and has already always had tons of value, you know, statistical models, which technically is still ML, 
but I think this is where I see the biggest delta and certainly where we're, you know, operating and seeing lots of, lots of value added. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, I'll try to be specific in how we tactically and strategically address uh, AI for Google Analytics and the clients that we serve. So, I mean, across the board, as all of us said, we, uh, we see AI helping in the back office, uh, the middle office and the front office for both within Moody's and for our clients, right? So in the back office, being specific, we see AI replacing sort of uh, RPA-based solutions for better automation and specifically to NLP and unstructured data. That's where we see the biggest bang for the buck. A lot of uh, analysts spend uh, manual effort in reading, understanding contents of news articles, financial documents, and we have built these AI solutions that can actually automate this to a large degree uh, in the back office. So we, we actually got a quick spread solution out. It's an automated spreading tool uh, that helps automate this, the financial spreading process. Uh, we've won about four financial awards for it uh, in, uh, in the AI financial services domain. Uh, in the middle office, we uh, see use of AI in better decisioning for credit, KYC compliance. We've got out, again, being specific, uh, an adverse media monitoring tool that helps uh, doing adverse media checks for compliance, uh, ESG and other applications in a matter of minutes uh, rather than days. Uh, and then in the front office, we see uh, kind of using AI to personalize the user experience for our clients. And, and really, th that's really what clients expect right now. Uh, whether it's a B2B client or a consumer a client that you're serving, the hyper-personalization is very critical and that's where AI can help uh, do this at scale. So the way we actually do this strategically is we've built what we call an ML fabric. Uh, it's a uh, machine learning fabric. Uh, and we have uh, all our machine learning AI components that are custom trained on Moody's data sitting as microservices. So we call them AI Lego blocks. And then we use the same Lego blocks to build multiple AI solutions across the board. Maybe NLP solutions will use the same set of Lego blocks, but tied together in a different manner. So by, by doing that, we are not having to retrain new models every time for different products, for different processes. And that's actually helped us speed up our time to market for AI products very quickly uh, compared to what we were able to do before. That's, I think that's great. Um, I'll talk about one that we talked a lot about supervised learning applications. So um, having a, you know, that label data and cross-checking the predictions that you have against the ground truth to improve performance over time. But there's another domain called reinforcement learning, which in short is uh, applying a technique to a, sequ a sequential decision task to try to optimize or minimize something uh, by taking the right actions over time to achieve that goal. And so we actually found a, this is going back to banking versus financial services, but um, we found a great use case of reinforcement learning in our financial markets around executing a trade um, in particular to achieve a trading strategy called VWAP, the volume weighted average price, which is a very common um, strategy in, in the markets and for, re for reinforcement learning, quite nice to use because it's a clear objective function to aim for. Um, and so we found, you know, at the beginning of the day, client will come in and they might have a, a bulk order of stocks they want to sell or buy. And if they were to do that all at once, it would potentially change the market, right? It would fluctuate the price too much. So the, the question is just how do we sequence the trades over the course of the day, so as to stay as close as possible to that VWAP curve and uh, not, you know, sh shift the waves in the market too much, and found this was actually a nice implementation of, of reinforcement learning. So, I think there's what I like about it goes back to what Prashant said about not sort of boiling the ocean and having like general purpose ML. But um, we started with a really specific problem, uh, got our first version of the product out for the particular. Uh, reinforcement learning VWAP trade execution. But then once we had that, we could build additional trading strategies on top of that. So moving to an arrival price trading strategy, liquidity seeking is another term. These are terms of art that have to do with uh, different institutional client trading preferences, um, but it's sort of that base, right? That, that, that we could re really build upon. And it was interesting as we, as we worked on it because you know, this is not, it's not just a science, it's not a plug and play application. There was a lot of work that went into handcrafting the input features, you know, having the back the backbone um, recurrent neural network sort of time series data model that could that could capture market information. So um, it's a I think it's really it's a really exciting space. But uh, again, started off with solving a really precise problem and scoping it down, having it very narrow before expanding and building on top. Um, Pratika, why don't we go to the next question? 
All right, so this dovetails with regulation, but as mentioned, I think traditional regulation has, has focused a lot on consumer protection. I'm coming from Canada, so the regulatory paradigm is a little bit different than that governing consumer rights in the United States. Um, but uh, it, it, definitely the case that the, the compliance departments in financial services companies at large have not historically been thinking about questions like bias or explainability of models. And it goes back to the fact that, you know, we've been using statistical models for a long time, but traditionally we were able to name, you know, the list of our input features and likely the associated weights with those features, as opposed to potentially having sort of a black box where we're not sure um, exactly how that input leads to the output. And so this is a question we think a lot about at Borealis. And actually it's, it's been an AI opportunity to us, for us, where we've got a team um, working on a, a um, automated model governance and verification platform. So it kind of falls into the, the broad range of, of ML ops, machine learning operations tools. But we're seeing it as a, a, a sort of, um, a, yeah, an, an opportunity to help contribute to the dialogue around fairness and, and bias and take it from the domain of principles, right? Sort of do no evil, you know, um, sorry, no, no jabs to Google, um, you know, uh, treat people fairly, right? Um, this becomes quite dicey because, and I think the interesting, the interesting challenges that we face is that we think when we use these terms qualitatively that we know what they mean and we agree upon their definition, but when forced to define that formally in a, you know, in a, in a, in a modeling context, suddenly we might realize that in the example of fairness, there's 21 different technical representations of this apparently uni-representational, uni univocal term. Um, so I think it's, 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 it's an interesting time you know, in the machine learning community as we're seeing this, this, this need to formalize these definitions uh, lead to interdisciplinary discussions with the legal community, you know, the, 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 so, the sociology community and, and, and intertwining that with, the, with technical communities to come up with the right solution. Um, Ashit, you'd mentioned a little bit on sort of developments in explainable AI and how that might, uh, that might lead to evolution in, in regulation and in, in evolving the dialogue. My take in Canada is there's a, a new bill that recently was released. It's called Bill C-11. It has provisions related to privacy as well as um, the almost like GDPR, the right to an explanation for, um, for the output of automated decision systems for sensitive use cases like, do you deserve a loan? Should you get a job, et cetera? But the trouble is that they didn't actually define an explanation. Right now we're in a status where Basically, the legal experts will say, someday this is going to go to court, and a judge is going to say what 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 part of a machine learning pipeline actually needs to be explained. And I kind of see the same with GDPR. So I think it's there's the the def, you know there's the way we think about explanation in the technical community, but that's not always what if you ask a legal expert, you know, what an explainable system looks like or what needs to be explained. It, it's not always the features and the weights. So I think that's. That's sort of the tension I see in, in the space um, alongside the ambiguity of the definition of fairness and bias. Yeah, yeah. I, well, I mean, the reality is that it's a very fast moving field. Things change almost weekly, if not uh, even more frequently. Right? So I, I think if you, if you want to really uh, set up an enterprise AI strategy, one thing you have to do to ensure sort of AI fairness is uh, set up organizational AI governance and standards. Uh, and that has to be comprised of AI experts, business experts, uh, AI ethicists, and data experts for sure, right? We talked about data a lot. Um, and this governance body and the governance framework will really make sure that the data is being leveraged responsibility, uh, uh, responsibly, data privacy laws are followed, and that's changing every, uh, again, every year as we see in, in terms of GDPR and other uh, you know, initiatives in Canada. I think even in the US, it's going to come down pretty hard. Uh, that's my projection. And also bias uh, in AI systems. So uh, the one thing to remember is that biased AI algorithms can actually potentially result in uh, AI systems that make costly mistakes, uh, that reduces customer satisfaction, and ultimately actually more importantly damages a brand's reputation. And one has to be very careful in that front. Uh, so this needs to be addressed by governance and standards. And one way that we look at uh, bias uh, in AI models, uh, I mean, AI models are built by human beings and we use data that could be biased. So 
continuous back testing and validation of these models uh, on new data um, with data experts to make sure that you know there's no inherent bias that's creeping in uh, with terms of using old data or you know particular types of data without reflecting the full population is, is one thing. Now, on the flip side, though, I think that AI can actually help in responsible lending. Uh, th there's a large portion of the world's population that does not have access to, to credit. And now you have a lot of humans and uh, banks making decisions. AI can actually help speed up the credit decisioning process uh, and help serve the underserved population by using non-traditional methodologies. Uh, so, you know, obviously we need to make sure that AI systems are biased, uh, are unbiased and responsible and transparent. Uh, but on the other hand, there's a lot of benefits of AI and banking because it can help the underprivileged, the underserved right now. Uh, and you know, we have cases even in this low interest rate environment where folks are having to pay 15, 20% interest rate because they need the money for day-to-day -day activities. And um, the AI can really help there. Yeah, and just to jump in, I mean, I think that um, you know, this, this is a very classic high-level argument here. And you know, I think on the one hand, um, and, and the most important hand, I think right now, you know, societally and, and functionally for you know, for enterprises adopting AI, you know, um, we are at a kind of difficult point with modern models with explainability and, and you know, even being able to certify any notion of fairness. Uh, and I, I'll note, Catherine, just riffing off your point, I mean, explainability, I think I've seen survey papers even reviewed some recently that have just as many definitions of what explainability should mean in the community as definitions of what fairness should mean. And that's not a, a, an excuse to shirk the responsibility socially and otherwise, you know, morally, et cetera, to do something. Because I think we have enough consensus on you know, the rough direction. But it is, I guess, to say that when, oh, well, I'll put it this way, when, when academic communities and, and new academic communities spring up and get as excited as they do, and when, when, when us academics get too excited about something, you should, should worry about the, <laughs> the, the pragmatic state, right? Both around the theory and the even definition of explainability fairness. Um, you know, but I do want to say, obviously, the high-level opportunity with any AI system, ML or not, is the ability to make systemic corrections when you have some bias. So if we can solve this challenge of detection, uh, and I'll get to just some high-level notes on that in a second, then obviously, you know, you can correct a bias more than you can correct the bias. You, know, you can write a couple of lines of a code and correct the bias you've identified um, in ways that you couldn't with, say, a bunch of analysts who are just using their gut instinct to you know, make loan decisions based on what they feel like about some person who applies. And so that's always been the opportunity. And, and I think we still very much believe that identification is often the, the hard point there. And I just wanna give a note there that I think, um, you know, th there's, there's, there's so much motion even on the theoretical understanding of how to interpret what is a modern, especially a deep neural network doing um, that I think there, there has to be a mix of kind of you know, theoretical and kind of core approaches to explainability and, and fairness and bias, but also just pragmatic techniques. So I want to riff off something that, you know, Prashant, you said earlier about just good experimental design, right? Setting up, you know, modular components that can be evaluated well is one answer to interpretability that is still going to be one of the cornerstones. Uh, using simpler models when complex ones are not necessary, uh, being able to audit how your data is labeled, that's something that, that, that we focus yeah, sure. on. Basic pragmatic things are going to be the mainstay, I think, of responsible AI practices today until the, you know, academic fun kind of resolves on, on, on the core principles, um, which, you know, will happen, but not right away. Yeah, Alex, just uh, want to add to what you said, like, uh, bias is also many times domain specific, like uh, in a health domain, we want to differentiate between gender and race, and in a finance domain, we do not want to do it. So depending upon what kind of a solution we are building, we need to see uh, what of a bias is genuine, what kind of a bias is not genuine. Uh, a second is, uh, as uh, Akshit mentioned, like uh, um, there is an inherent bias in society also. So AI gives us opportunity to correct that bias. And then uh, we want to ensure that we identify the bias in society and we want to, uh, we should ensure that do we want to present what society has today or we want to correct it. And then the uh, quick uh, steps generally I've seen in Google and other companies were bias comes at a data collection process, it comes at data processing stage, it comes at algorithmic stage, and then it comes at a feedback stage because the feedback loop continue to get changed. And then uh, like, uh, as you said, like there are papers based upon that uh, one can build solution which fix the population bias, behavior bias or temporal bias, like one of the technique we built at Google was TCAF. 
so using that one can determine what model is actually learning. So yes, this is an area which where AI will evolve. And I think we need to look for opportunities um, that how we can make AI uh, more unbiased. I just wanted to close and say, yeah. I really liked Ashit's comment though, that two things. One, Prashant, as you said, there's, there's the status quo in, in working with machine learning is we assume that the future will look the past, will look like the past. And I think that's the design principle that, you know, the machine learning practitioners need to, um, need to think about in that often with these like racially sensitive issues or, uh, I'm, I'm getting cut off, so I can't think. I'm sorry, I hope you guys are gonna edit. <laughs> um, Pratika. Well, just, just to add on one thing. Sorry, we are out of time, so we do have to um, we do have to end the session. But this has been an awesome discussion, and the great thing is that we can continue the conversation in the networking app in the uh, during the event. So I want to say a special thank you to all of our panelists, and thank you to Catherine for moderating. That was awesome, and we really appreciate your content. For the audience, go ahead and make your way to your next session, and along the way, make sure to accept your connection request and check out our AI exhibits. Thanks so much, and we'll see you around. <laughs>